you all so much for joining us to celebrate Dream Books and Gamblers, Black women's work in Chicago's policy game. My name is Heather and I'm the Senior Publicity Manager at the University of Illinois Press. And I'm just gonna go over some brief logistical information and introduce our guests before we get started. First of all, thank you so much, Dr. Schleybach and Dr. Harris for being here today. They're gonna talk for about 45 minutes and then we will have time for a 15 minute Q&A at the end. You can enter questions throughout the event by clicking the Q&A button at the bottom of your screen. You can use promo code DREAM22 to get a 40% discount on the book on the University of Illinois Press website. The promo code and a link to the book will be put into the chat box. We will also be recording the event and posting it on our YouTube channel afterwards. You'll receive an email from Zoom after the event that will have both the discount code and a link to our YouTube channel as well. And now I will just briefly introduce our guests. Betsy Schleybach is an Associate Professor of History at Lawrence University. She holds a PhD in American Studies from St. Louis University. She is the author of Along the Streets of Bronzeville, Black Chicago's Literary Landscapes, published by the University of Illinois Press in 2013, and Dream Books and Gamblers, Black Women's Work in Chicago's Policy Game. Her work also appears in the Journal of African American Studies and Southern Studies. Schleybach offers courses in 20th century American history, African American history, and urban history. LaShawn Harris is an Associate Professor of History at Michigan State University and Assistant Editor for the Journal of African American History. Harris's scholarly essays have appeared in the Journal of African American History, Journal of Social History, Journal of Urban History, and Souls. Her first book, Sex Workers, Psychics, and Number Runners, Black Women's Work in New, New York City's Underground Econ Economy, was published by the University of Illinois Press in 2016 and won the 2017 Organization of American Historians Darling Clark Hine Award for the Best Book in African American Women's and Gender History, and the Philip Taft Labor Prize for, from the Labor and Working Class History Association. Harris is part of the Organization of American Historians Prestigious Distinguished Lectureship Program. Her next book, Say Her Name, um, Eleanor Bumpers, Police Violence, and the Crime That Changed New York City will be published by Beacon Press. And now, without further ado, I will turn it over yes. to Dr. Schleybach and Dr. Harris. Thanks again to everyone for being here today. Yes. Thank you, Heather. Thank you, Heather. Thank you. And thank you to the University of Illinois Press for hosting this virtual um, book event. Um, thank you to our virtual audience for attending this really special event. And thank you, Dr. Slaybach, for writing such a wonderful book, one that I encourage everyone to uh, purchase via the University of Illinois' uh, uh, website. So Dr. Slaybach is an exceptional scholar. Mm -hmm. uh, I first met her at the Association for the Study of African American Life and History uh, Conference many years ago. And since that time, I've read her work, I've assigned her journal articles to my students, and we served on several panels together um, over the years. And over those years at conferences, uh, Dr. Schleybach, or as I know her, Betsy, has shared her work on Chicago's policy uh, queens uh, many times. And I'm so delighted that the book is out and that everyone gets a chance to read this really wonderful piece of scholarship. Dream Books and Gamblers is a must read. Schleybach impressively weaves together a fascinating narrative about Chicago's policy racket between 1890 and 1968. Policy provided Black women with a livelihood for themselves and their families. At the same time, navigating gender expectations, aggressive policing, and other hazards of the informal economy, all of that led women to refashion ideas about Black womanhood, respectability, labor, and police surveillance. A major, 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 major contribution to the fields of business and Black women's histories, Dream Books and Gamblers illuminates women's important and diverse roles in informal uh, economies. This book, it, this book is certain to transform our understanding of African-American history, leaving scholars with new ways of researching and discussing Black life, labor, and culture. So, uh, congratulations. Today is the first day of, this is the official day of the book launch. So again, many, many, many congrats. So let's start with an easy question, which right. is, <laughs> um, can you talk a little bit about the book's origins? What, what drew you to this topic? Well, uh, first, uh, LaShawn, as I know you, thank you so much for your kind words and uh, this book would never be here without your support and your own scholarship. So um, I'm I'm just 
in, indebted to you and really appreciate your praise um, and your, your critique too. Um, and so I, I think where I was first drawn to this, so my first book is about an arts movement and liter literary movement on the South Side of Chicago, um, known as the Chicago Black Renaissance. And um, as I was writing that, I was um, at the Harsh Collection, the archives at the Chicago Public Library on the South Side of Chicago, and I was trying to figure out how how these artists um, made a living and how you know who was paying the writers, how were they, how were they, you know, where did the support come from? Um, and I started to to hear about these kings, these these policy kings, and I thought, oh, that's interesting. Who are these guys? And I started reading, and um, uh, reading the Defender, looking at the Illinois Writers Project, um, some of their files about um, this group of men who controlled gambling. Sometimes they're referred to as the Black Mafia, and I found out that they had donated a lot of money to institutions like the Southside Community Arts Center um, or and that the Southside Writers Group met at um, public libraries on the South Side. And I thought, wow, so these, these guys who are involved in gambling are funding the arts. Mm -hmm. And I thought, that's really interesting. Um, you know, what does that say about the arts? What does that say about gambling? And at, and at that interval of my research career, I was focused more on the arts. And so they were a footnote. And um, but then I, I got a few questions about the men and, and what was policy gambling. And then, and I thought, well, you know, if men were involved, if they were Kings, there's gotta be Queens. Mm -hmm. Right. And then I turned to you <laughs> and because you had written about, um, Stephanie St. Clair and, and I thought, wow, she's just amazing. And there's gotta be some women like that in Chicago, um, and so I started digging into and looking at the wives of some of the policy kings and um, just, you know, reading uh, a few dissertations um, on the South Side about policy gambling and then uh, reading Victoria Walcott's book, Remaking Respectability, about policy in Detroit. And um, and her work focuses on on women um, and how they used used gambling. Um, and for for a lot of different reasons and and there was there's a viable study of chicago and i and i had one and i thought okay well um can i do a la like can i do a labor history because I, i'm not a labor historian I've, I'm, i have a phd in american studies and i wrote about an arts movement and but i i sort of used policy as as a that way to to bridge my study of literature and how people, you know, made, try to made, make a way through living in poverty and the, the very hard life that was in Bronzeville, they turned to policy. And then um, that became an opportunity for me to look at the gender dynamics of it and how Black women um, uh, sought, sought it out. They, and they, they said for some, it was a refuge for them. Um, and they, they really, one of them says it's the best, literally the best job she ever had. And she says that in 1937. Wow. Wow. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Yep. So excavating histories and stories about African-American women in general and uh, Black women, uh, policy uh, women, particularly those who are, or more generally people who are in, uh, participate in the urban um, informal economy, is definitely no easy task, as you already know. Um, could you talk about some of the challenges of doing this type of work? And also, what surprised you about mid-20th century Chicago? Well, um, I, I think my the first one of the first challenges was to talk about this experience that um, didn't leave policy gambling as sort of this novelty, um, and that I, I really wanted to ground it in a sense of it was legitimate work, um, and there was a grind to it. Um, its wages were at times unpredictable. Um, and and so I I didn't want to treat treat this particular form of work any differently than I might treat uh, an examination of other kinds of work. Um, so just because it's not on the books doesn't mean it's 
it doesn't de deserve the, the, the historian's respect, right? Um, and so always framing the story about policy gambling um, in, in a way where we take that labor very seriously. Um, and so that was sort of my, my, one of my, one of the challenges at times, um, is to, you know, keeping in mind, like, this is work, this is nine to five labor. There are definitely some risks involved. Um, so let's approach this with, with a lot of respect. Um, and what surprised me about 20th century Chicago, um, and 20th century black Chicago is that, uh, people had very different opinions about policy gambling. Um, and so some, some of them were like, no, this is a scourge on our community. Um, some ministers would every week preach sermons about just how terrible this was. But then you could, you could go to a different church in the same denomination and have a preacher say, yeah, you know, okay, that's great. You know, we're going to have a reading during the communion pay attention to the hymns. And, um, and so it's, and the articles in the Defender really too, there's, they just defy a consensus about the, the ills of, of policy. No one is ever in agreement upon that. It always depends who's asking. Um, and so that was really surprising to me is that um, within Black Chicago, um, everybody knew somebody who did it right, who sold policy, who bet, who won, um, who consulted a medium. Um, and, and that seemed to be okay. And, and that was, that was really surprising to me that um, I, I could never say like, oh, they thought it was bad, because 10 more people would be like, oh, it's fine. You know, it was right. great. Right. Yeah. <laughs> um, and what, and what is policy? I ask this question because oftentimes, um, just if within scholarship, within um, popular culture, we tend to, well, some people tend to throw the word, they use the word policy and numbers, numbers gambling um, interchangeably. So what is policy gambling and what is the difference between, and what is the difference between policy gambling and numbers running, which, which is what they did mostly in uh, a place like Harlem? Right. So um, policy gambling was had an entirely different format than than numbers, um, as I understand it. <laughs> and and uh, 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 so numbers, um, the winning numbers in Harlem were based upon the last four digits of the paramute, I think four digits of the paramutual draw um, numbers for the day. And so those numbers were, were fixed and very difficult to, to fudge. So it was sort of, it was difficult to cheat in that way. Um, policy gambling uh, always offered gamblers their choice of numbers. And so policy gambling, um, there was usually a morning and an evening drawing, and it looks a lot like Powerball today. Uh, and literally, um, uh, policy stations, they put numbers in little capsules and then spin them in a drum um, or, uh, or a wheel, and then they would take them out, and um, those would be the winning numbers for that specific policy station. And so you could place bets at mul multiple policy stations all around Chicago um, or Detroit and um, in multiple drawings and and pick the numbers that you wanted to pick. And, a, uh, and so it would you would try to pick numbers. Um, they would pick 12 capsules from the drum um, and those would be the winning numbers for that drawing at that time of day. And so there's a lot of choice involved. You could play uh, someone's birthday or um, maybe the day you got divorced, if that was like a really <laughs> great day for you, you know, <laughs> um, or if the White Sox played well, you know, right. like, like play or the, you know, play those um those combinations. And so frequently people would play what's called a gig, which would be three different numbers. Um, and then they would submit those numbers to a runner who would then take those numbers back to the station and enter them into the drawing for that morning or evening. That's a great segue into my uh, next, my next question, which is a sort of a little bit, I'm framing it within the context of the 2017 um, 
podcast, Brownsville, right? So Brownsville, for people who don't know, it was a audio series um, that explored the lives of Chicago policy queens um, during the 1940s. It premiered in uh, 2017 and it starred Lawrence Fishburg, um, I think T uh, Tika Sumter, and also Lorenz Tate. And from the podcast, I mean, you get the impression that most of the major players, um, either the uh, the the policy uh, kings are mostly men, and the runners and the clerks are mostly men. Um, and also, if you read certain certain scholarship, it's it's a similar type of kind of masculine lens or masculine story. So I wanted to ask you about erasure. You know, why do you think uh, black women? have been erased from that particular story? And what is the attraction to policy um, for Black women? And what roles did they play within, within the racket? So I, I think that erasure um, results from the type of story that someone would want to tell about the Black, uh, about Black Chicago. Um, and uh and, and even in the in the podcast, there are uh, women characters, but they're 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 always secondary. I think um, even one of the mediums they consult, uh, like she doesn't even survive the the episode. Sorry, spoiler alert <laughs> for that. Um, and and I I think that it doesn't fit a story um, of the mob. Or the mafia. So we have this sort of uh, this vision in our mind when you talk about the mob or the mafia or the or the black mafia that you're talking about men, nice. right? Um, and so they black women's labor in in this arena doesn't fit that narrative. Um, and I, I think that also has something to do with. Um, something that you write about in your book that there, there's a considerable dose of sexism within this world um, where the um, women take on sort of the clerk positions, the secretarial labor. Um, and so that our task as historians, uh, we have, we have to be able to sort of um, unpack that sexism. And if you look at women who are clerks, they're they're doing the accounting. Right, right. It's a cred incredibly sophisticated labor, right. um, and that there were there definitely were black women who were writers who canvassed neighborhoods, yeah. um, like door to door salesmen, um, and so they were doing quote unquote masculine work, um, and and so I, I think that uh, for for some their role in the informal economy, black women's role in the informal economy doesn't fit the narrative where men are running the underworld or men are men are are the subversives right. um and 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 like you said like uh there are there are thousands of women who are employed in yes. policy gambling um running stations out of their home uh and you know you can read um the world according to fanny davis yeah. uh, out of uh, that's right Oh, such a great book yes, too. Yeah. Um, and she talks about how her mother was able to um, hold down her household by running a policy station out, out, you know, out of her kitchen, right? Like this vision of her mother sitting at the kitchen table, tallying slips. And in that way, that sort of fits the vision of the patriarchal narrative, but she's also subverting it at the same time. And I think that's one of the reasons why policy labor was attractive to some black women, because they could, um, you know, they, they could uh, stay at home, they could watch their children, um, they could run shops out of their home. And I, I think that it was attractive for, for that aspect. Um, and and also like if you're having two drawings a day, one in the morning and one in the evening, um, perhaps the bulk of your labor is, is taking place around those two times, and you might have a little more free time during the day where you can meet those other family obligations you have right. as a wife, as a mother, as a caretaker, um, as or a having 
Yeah. yeah. And as a community advocate. Right. An organizer yeah. or an right. activist. Sure. Sure. Right. So there's a lot of flexibility involved in, in policy gambling. And I think that's one of the reasons why it's so attractive to women. Yeah. And it seems like, you know, at least in your book, I'm not maybe, I'm not as explicit as, as and this is why I love this book because it's so explicit about the type of work that women are doing when it comes to gambling practices is that they're using that um, veil of visibility as well as invisibility to their advantage in a lot of different a lot of different ways. Um, could you talk a little bit about uh, the rewards and the risks of doing um, this type of work, whether they are uh, operating wheels, uh, clerks, um, writers, runners? What are the what are some of the risks and rewards, and how do they navigate those risks? So I I think. Um... We'll start about the rewards. So if you think about what a runner would do or a writer, a policy writer might do is go door to door in a neighborhood, um, selling slips, taking down numbers, um, combinations, and then getting them back to the station. And um, so, so women could lean on their community contacts um, and, uh, and create networks um, in their community to, to perform well in their business. Um, and so, and you could often do that with a child in tow, right? Uh, so you could hang out in your backyard with, you know, as you're doing laundry and someone else is in a nearby apartment and just shout down, you know, what what's your picks for the day? And then they shout them to you and you write them down. And so the flexibility I think is, is attractive. Um, but also the fact is like that writers weren't necessarily salary. They, their cut depended, um, upon how many bets they could take during the day. Um, and so they were also, I think, positioned precariously in their relation to the station, um, because they had to generate their own revenue. Um, and uh, only a portion of that actually went to them. The rest went to the house. Um, and it's also risky because they had to become well-known. So if someone wanted to get into policy gambling, they, someone had to give you, give them your name and then you become visible in the eyes of the police. And so that's the sort of the visibility and visibility, invisibility binary I kind of work with in the book, um, and that to be successful, you had to drum up a lot of business. You had to create a, a reputation as reliable um, or cunning, perhaps it depends on the situation. Uh, but that made you well, that made you well known, which was also a considerable risk. Um, Thank yeah. you. Uh, speaking of well-known people, so during the 1930s, West Indian immigrant Madam Stephanie Sinclair was a prominent, you know, numbers uh, banker in Harlem. Um, she owned property. She amassed thousands of dollars a year. Um, she could be strolling down Harlem's Lenox Avenue, um, wearing like a colorful turban, mm -hmm. uh, handmade beads, just like really looking fly <laughs> yeah. in Harlem. Um, everyone really knew who she was and what she did. And this was someone who was just really brazen and just didn't, didn't care. Um, she was a known numbers banker. Some of the women in your study are, again, very deliberate and careful about uh, their visibility and public associations with uh, Chicago's policy uh, game. In fact, you identify them as, quote unquote, silent partners in the wheels. Can you talk a bit about women like Harriet Jones and Florentine Stevens, of uh, their labor, um, their reign as policy queens, as well as their need to uh, need for invisibility? Sure. So um, I guess I'll start with Harriet Jones. She's the mother to George McKissick and, oh, I'm going to forget the other one. What's the third Jones brother. I have my book here. I can look. Yeah, yeah. Um, <laughs> so he's she's she's the um, Henry. I don't know. Anyway, yeah. <laughs> um, so she's the mother to the three Jones brothers who um, were well known and and were called policy kings. Um, and uh, but um, she was never. She sort of kept herself out of the spotlight. Um, and 
and was always she was always very pray pre, like praising her sons, heaping tons of praise on them. I mean, and and they were amazing. They were they were successful. They opened up um, department stores. They had a, a milk distributor business, and they were also renowned policy kings, um, employing hundreds all over Bronzeville, and uh, but and. They were also investigated um, in the Kefauver Commission, this 1951 Senate commission that was um, investigating organized crime and in interstate uh, commerce. And so they sat before a Senate committee and Kefauver questioned the, the oldest, um, uh, George, and then also sort of their, their uh, one of their employees, Ted Rowe, Theodore Rowe. Um, and whenever questioned, uh, George uh, always mentioned his mother oh. and said, you know, and, he, and so Keith Alver asked him, what kind of cut are you taking in? How much money are you taking in? And he said, well, my brothers and I and my mom were all taking in the same percentage. And I thought, oh, that's really interesting. And so I went to the archives, the National Archives, and I was able to find the documentation that proves that Harriet was making as much, if not more, than her sons. Um, and they also, they always went to her whenever there was some sort of tension among the brothers. Um, in the Defender, I believe, uh, one of the sons says that she was the Supreme Court. Mm -hmm. like she, you know, everything stopped with her. Like, she made the decisions. And and I thought that was really interesting because... Um, the, the brothers are all over the papers. They're all over the Defender. And Harry is not. Uh, her name is, and I chose one anecdote and put it in the introduction to sort of illustrate this, this silent partner strategy. The family makes, or the family made a yearly donation to Provident Hospital, uh, the first black owned and operated hospital in the United States. And um, Harriet's name is listed in the, underneath the photograph, but her lawyer appears in the picture, mm -hmm. not her. And so she she's taking herself out of it, right? Like she's removing herself from um, from the public from the public eye when it comes to policy gambling. Um, and she comes she weaves back in and out, but she's she's not one to be you know walking up and down thirty um, fifth street, <laughs> right? Like, <laughs> Um, but she did li live like a luxurious life. She attends right. fashion shows where her daughters-in-law and her granddaughter Harriet um, walk, the, the, you know, do the, the walk and um, she's wearing furs and things like that. But um, she's never as out front as her sons are. She, right. she puts, she maintains distance. Yeah. And I kept thinking, um, why are you know i mean I, I i i get it but i kept thinking to myself you know why are they snitching on their mother i kept i kept yeah. saying that to myself like they could have just mentioned yeah my brothers and he could have mentioned my brothers and i are involved but when he mentioned her i was like why why are you telling all your moms yeah uh, mm -hmm. but mm -hmm. but but i get it uh what about florentine uh, stevens um she, she uh her story is a little bit different. Right. Um, she and a few other, um, Irene Coleman, Anne Roan, there's, there's another, so there's a, another, there's a different category of queen too. Right. Um, and they're a little more visible. They, mm -hmm. they sort of, uh, they, they hold some power in, in some of the gossip columns of Jet Magazine and, the defender um and their their visibility i i think is they're a little more willing to be uh out and about and um among the partying set in a way mm -hmm. harriet is, is embraces the role of matriarch um in a different way than stevens or roan um and and sometimes like both of those women for example um they also are involved in quote unquote legitimate businesses right. Too. So they're they're sort of existing on the, in the formal and informal economy at the same time, and so I think that might afford them different a different type of protection, perhaps, okay. um, and that sort of the 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 
the double business front might create different opportunities for them. Right, right. Thank you. Mm -hmm. um, your book, I think, brilliantly deals uh, or shows that not, and I'm going to switch gears just a little bit. I'm going to okay. talk about the police. Um, your book brilliantly shows that not all police violence was, was public, right? Uh, Black women's encounters and struggles with police were not limited to brutal and life-threatening assaults on the streets, um, you know, subway stations, police cars, precincts, and other public places. Police violence often occurred beyond uh, the public gaze, mostly in Black women's homes. Domestic spaces, as many people have argued, those encountering, those embodying kind of laughter, creativity, love, and pleasure, and care, caregiving became sites of harm and injury for Black women. Uh, they became sites of fear and human violation. And borrowing from writer James Baldwin, uh, these domestic spaces for Black women became occupied territory. So I mm -hmm. wanted to know what encounters did Black women policy workers have with carceral forces, namely the Chicago police? And could you talk a little bit about, also about, um, how did they navigate navigate some of that that force that they were that they were facing um, from the Chicago PD? So the um, the Chicago police they uh, issue an all out um, or deploy an all out assault on policy gambling in the late 1940s, especially um, when uh, a few mayors are seeking reelection, and um, one of the ways that they they want to, you know, create re create results is to rid the city of policy gambling, and um, and so you see, uh, you can look at the Chicago Police Department annual reports from forty seven to about sixty eight, and they keep statistics on arrests. Um, and by fifty three, there's racial data for the arrests, and eighty five percent of all policy gambling arrests. Um, in 1953 are arrests of African Americans. Um, when in fact, and policy gambling was happening all over the city. Um, white people are selling policy too, or they're running policy shops. Um, but the, the, the image that's peddled uh, in a few of these mayoral campaigns is that policy happens on the South side, black neighborhoods, and that's where we're going to go to rid the neighbor, rid the city of vice. Um, and so the, I mean, there's, there's, there's like just surveil surveillance techniques, wiretapping, um, the use of informants. Uh, and, um, so what I found was, um, the last two chapters of the book look at arrest records and court documents. Nice. And so um, in those chapters, I went to the Cook County Circuit Court archives and found 57 arrest records for Black women arrested for any involvement in policy gambling. Um, so um, maybe they had a sl had slips on their person or they were arrested for running a station out of their apartments or homes. And um, the, what those slips tell you is, is that the surveillance was just staggering. I mean, they, women are arrested at all hours of the day, um, sometimes in the presence of children, um, around dinner time and, um, police officers, uh, just walk right in, you know, it's, it's really, really was, um, it took me back a few steps after yeah. like looking at those records over and over again. Um, yeah, because these are these are home these are home invasions. Yes, yes, right. Yeah, um, and I mean you can look at the addresses. They're not invading stations all the time. It's it's this apartment on Forty Fourth Street, um, and it's and then list times of day who uh, the records like who's there in the house. And it's someone's grandmother, their their five year old daughter, and um, it's it was just relentless, just relentless. Yeah. And so what what women would do is oftentimes, um, uh, so to run a policy shop, you had to have all your supplies, and then you had to have like a large um, access to a, a lot of cash, mm -hmm. right? And so sometimes they would store those safes like full of cash in other people's apartments. Um, 
or uh, they would break their leases and just oh. pick up and move uh, in the middle of the night, move somewhere else. Um, and 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 that I I sort of was able to gauge that because people's addresses would change so often throughout all the records. Um, and I mean, that has a profound effect on one's domestic life, course, right? Yes. Yeah, it's profoundly unsettling. Um, and and so and so those strategies of of constant movement um to evade detection um and but and but they, also like women sought sought uh, through the courts they fought back um and and uh, oftentimes uh cops would arrest them without a warrant or um or you know violate their their um their right of to you know like stop and seizing their property and so they would they would fight back through the courts um um knowing knowing what their rights were in, in those situations yeah and and at least at least from what i know about um harlem um many of uh, the policy um numbers numbers gambling women particularly someone like a stephanie sinclair um is 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 connected to the police in particular yeah. ways. So I was wondering if um, the Jones brothers, uh, may, probably not their mother, but are are you find? Did you find that uh, some of these women were connected to the police um, in hopes of ev evading um, arrest? In other words, um, uh, is the Chicago PD corrupt, and do they participate in um, in policy gambling? Oh yes, yeah. There's plenty of graft. Um, yeah, and some of some of it. Um, I leaned a lot on uh, Nathan Thompson's book, uh, Kings, uh, where he talks about how um, all of this is sort of wound up in the Democratic political machine too, um, and uh, so like uh, the the police would make sort of cut a deal with the Joneses and said, okay, we'll let this run wide open if you can guarantee a certain kind of vote, uh, you know, in November, right? Um, and so that existed all the time. Uh, and the defender would would just cry from the rooftops whenever uh -huh. it found out that one of the police officers was playing policy on the side. Wow. Um, just, they would just, you know, echo like <laughs> that um, all over the place. Um, but then also some of it, uh, Theodore Rowe, in his testimony before the Senate committee in 1951, he talks about how that um, when women were arrested, uh, he would have to go, the Jones brothers would send him down to the station um, to, pay, to, to pay their bail and bail them out immediately. Um, and often, sometimes it would happen that uh, one woman reported that she never even saw the inside of a jail cell wow. because Roe would be there already, um, like someone would tell him, one of the cops would tell him, hey, you know, we're, we did a raid here, you need to come um, bail your women out. And so so the, the threat of arrest was real and there's very much, there's risk and danger in that. Uh, but some of the women would report that um, I would be bailed out before I yes. even even so made it to the station. So convictions are are are, are low. Yes, yes, yeah. they were. Arrest rates yeah. are sky high, but convictions uh, were very low. Yeah, yeah. Uh, I want to talk to you a little bit about Chicago's first uh, policy queens. So uh, shared experiences of personal struggles and common survival strategies did not always allow a diverse cross-section of urban Black policy women to forge like bonds and friendships or partnerships. So because of that competition, the competitive and unpredictable nature of informal labor and some women's desire for economic and social circumstances, uh, hustling became really an individual journey based on primarily on self-preservation and personal um, monetary gain. Uh, competition and envy sometimes exploded into violent uh, confrontations and oftentimes spilled over into legal, legal battles in the courtroom. So I found the storyline of what you call, who you call um, Chicago's first uh, policy queens, Eudora Johnson uh, Binga and Elizabeth Slater's uh, storyline really fascinating. 
Why do you identify those women as Chicago's first policy queens? And how did the desire for like wealth and to be Chicago's reigning queen cause friction between those two? Well, the um, I I found out about them um, actually through um, Chicago's first policy king, John Mushmouth Johnson. Mm -hmm. um, and he's called Mushmouth because I guess he he loved to swear. Uh, <laughs> and so he's he's got my favorite nickname in the whole world. Um, and so he he and his family. So he Eudora, his mother, I think a cousin. Um, migrated to Chicago um, very early on, before the Great Migration. I think they come came to Chicago from St. Louis in 1893, and he starts uh, going to work in some of the the bars and saloons on the South Side. Eventually, he takes over one of the clubs, and he becomes involved in policy gambling. And after he's become a pretty well known policy king, he starts dating Elizabeth Slaughter who was a well-known milliner. So she's a uh, she's an entrepreneur. She's a graduate of the Armour Institute where she took um, its present day um, IIT on the South side. She took uh, courses in domestic arts. Um, and she too is a migrant. She uh, is from Louisville, Kentucky. Um, and, but she eventually she starts making hats for the elite of black Chicago society. And, um, she and Mushmouth get engaged, but then Mushmouth dies in 1907 and they aren't, they aren't married. Um, and so this, this starts a court battle over Mush Mushmouth's fortune. And so at first slaughter is vying for the fortune against uh, Mushmouth's mother. And then Eudora sweeps in as the sister who says that, this that inheritance inheritance is rightfully hers, um, and, and it's definitely not slaughters. Um, and there's 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 not a lot of good feeling between the women um, during those court cases. Right. The the um, there's some pretty serious insults lobbied back and forth that Mushmouth and Slaughter were living in sin and things like that. Um, and eventually in 1913. Uh, this is after Eudora marries Jesse Binga, who opens and operates the first bank on the South Side. Um, and he's beloved by the community. Uh, Eudora uh, wins the court battle. Um, and, and so I, I present this story as two women um, in policy's orbit, right? Um, and they they have similar motivations for for wanting the inheritance and slaughter feels that it's rightfully hers as his partner um in eudora feels that no it's her family's right. and um it's interesting because there's a battle in the courtroom but then there's also a battle in the press right. and uh so the broad acts and then the defender sort of pick up this story um and when i was writing the the book um one of my reviewers uh, asked me to consider whether or not there these two women really had any ha had a problem with each other mm -hmm. um and what if you know maybe and that encouraged me to think that they're offering two different versions of of queendom maybe right, right? one where the woman ascends the the ladder the social ladder through her entrepreneurship um She's a well-known milliner, and certainly this inheritance would have helped her out right. in her business. Right. Um, and with the other, Eudora uh, clearly wants to ascend the social ladder. She marries Jesse Binga, right? Um, and they 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 have a great life um, un until he's you know he gets uh -huh. in trouble with the law, um, and and she she kind of is you know, she's putting the blocks together for the, I guess, the matriarch type of queen, right. right? That Harriet Jones will will put her own spin on that later on in the 30s. Um, and so Eudora uh, uses the money um, for philanthropy. Um, there's a rumor. That's how Jesse Bingo opens the bank is right. because of wow. that money. Yeah. Yeah. Um, 
And so it's, I, I think it presents two different stories of how these women use policy gambling to ascend the social ladder and also offer new definitions of respectability. Yeah, for sure. Um, right, right. And their own, their own um, ideas about, you know, economic stability and wealth for themselves too, yeah. right? Clearly, because mm -hmm. they, they each had their own um, agendas and, and motivations. Um, but you do also talk about women who do form partnerships and businesses together, right? Who do forge those friendships or at least business um, business friendships. So what, what, what does that look like? You know, or give us an example of women who are forming um, businesses together, either policy wheels or legitimate um, businesses. So there, I think um, one of my favorite women is uh, Anne Roan, Queen Anne Roan, um, who was married to a policy king in Detroit uh, she, they divorced, she took some of her money and came to Chicago, um, and started working with the Jones brothers, um, but also, uh, Coleman and, and others to set up, um, uh, the Hawthorne milk distributorship. Um, and so she's, she's working with women to, um, to sort of run this like dry goods store. Um, and there, there are queens too, like Roan and Coleman, et cetera, uh, who employ women. Um, and so she, she's also at the, the, you know, she's at the helm of this remarkable business model where women and men report to her. Um, I think of a woman named Celeste White who managed um, uh, pick, uh, pickup men who would ride around Bronzeville and, you know, drop money places. And that was an incredibly dangerous job. Um, and they reported to her. Um, and, and so I, I think about that, um, that these women were able to wield authority um, while also employing other women, right. And, and giving them access to um, this particular form of labor. Uh, and I, I kind of, I, I wish I would have gotten more into like the interiority of that relationship. Oh. Um, and, uh, that, that's something that, um, I wish would have appeared more in the text, yeah. um, is, you know, how these women were managing the business, um, and what that working relationship with other women looked like. Or men. Cause I think yeah. there are some yeah. examples of, um, some of these women forming these business partnerships with 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 men at the same mm -hmm. time. Mm -hmm. So um, what happens in the 1930s? So until the 1930s, Chicago's policy uh, um, game, like very much like Harlem's numbers racket, was dominated, or at least was yeah, pre pre predominated by Black policy laborers. What happens in the 1930s? How does a predominantly Black gambling enterprise go white? Well, um... This is where the Italian mafia comes in, actually. And so um, part of this is lore and myth. I think there's a lot of that involved. Um, but there's also fact as well. So there's this sort of fictitious the meeting, I guess, um, that, that happens between Al Capone and the Black Policy Kings, where Capone says, you can have policy, I'll keep um, liquor and alcohol sales. Um, but eventually that relationship breaks down and in the early 40s and then um, so uh, George Jones Jr. is sent to prison, a federal prison. Um, and while he's incarcerated in Terre Haute, Indiana, he meets one of the members of the outfit or the Italian mob. Um, and they start talking about what policy gambling is. Um, and then upon their release, you see the an aggressive takeover um, by the mafia in Bronzeville um, to the point where one of the Jones brothers is kidnapped, um, another one is murdered. And at that point, Harriet goes, she she appears in the media and she says, we're out, we're leaving. And she moves the family to Mexico City. Um, they leave Ted Rowe there to run things while they're gone. Um, but eventually, like, I think that starts, starts the process of 
white takeover in the in the 40s and 50s, um, which culminates in the state taking it over in 1974 when the Illinois state lottery um, takes over. I have a question about that, but I think there it's a, it's five fifty. Well, here it's five fifty. Yeah. Um, and I think there are, or I think there are a couple of questions in the chat. Yeah, we've got one which you started to actually talk about, Elizabeth, um, asking, um, did you observe any uptick in women's participation or changing roles within the policy orgs during the war years? During the war years, um, I. I saw the the biggest uptick in women's pol um, participation during the Great Depression, um, when things were incredibly bad uh, for Black women um, in on the South Side. Um, I think uh, with with World War II, there are I think opportunities presented themselves elsewhere. Um, but in the book, I'm, I mainly saw an uptick in participation during the Great Depression. Um, and, uh, but then, the, but then I guess, you know, maybe that we could, I would hypothesize that the numbers of arrests in the early 50s, um, you might confirm that there there is an increase during the 40s, but in my examination, I mostly looked at uh, what I saw was their involvement in the great during the Great Depression. All right, so we just had another one come in, um, and Bridget would like to know how you integrate this history, these stories, and these women into your twentieth his twentieth history U.S. history surveys. Great question. Um, and so um, in my in my U.S. history courses, um, policy appears um, when we talk about the Great Depression, as I just said, um, and <clears throat> as sort of an alternative. Um, so I, I sometimes I show that image of the victims of the Louisville flood, where they're standing in front of that massive billboard of a white family driving down this, you know, it says, uh, you know, the American dream. And we talk about sort of the, the, the hypocrisy of that image. And then in the foreground, you see a group of African Americans very, you know, very well dressed in line for bread. Um, and I talk about how, you know, the, um, we talk about the racism of the New Deal, about how relief, um, you know, white families got more on relief than black families. And so um, for many, uh, they had to turn to the informal economy um, because the formal economy was not, was certainly not serving them. Um, and so they turned to policy gambling to help make, make ends meet. Um, policy gambling resurfaces later on um, when we talk about uh, housing and urban development, um, urban renewal programs, and uh, some of the, the failures of those programs to take into consideration what Black families wanted. Um, and, uh, you know, I mean, like the Dan Ryan Expressway is literally like built on top of the westernmost part, part of the South Side, displacing Black families. Um, and so again, uh, when people ha hit those hard times, they could turn to policy kings and queens for help, um, or they could turn to policy gambling for work. Um, and so it's always, it's there, it's still there now too, um, and supporting and, and helping sustain the community. Thank you for those. Oh, oh I think I was just going to say that's what all we have. Uh, oh, wait, something else just came in. Mm -hmm. um, okay. Uh, what pedagogical disciplines have you studied and consciously implemented to refine your methods of teaching American history? Additionally, how mm -hmm. do you navigate the fundamental difference in human experience between white students and students of color when one group can empathize with the taught history while the other group can only sympathize? All right. Whoa, okay. Um, well, I think that definitely when I teach um, African-American history and also U.S. history, um, I, I talk about my own whiteness as, a, as the person at the head of the classroom um, and what my motivations are and why I'm there. 
Um, I don't know if if I agree with the statement that one group can only empathize and one group could only sympathize, I, I don't think I want to reduce my students to that binary. Although I, I, I think I understand what the question is asking. Um, because I, I think if I do my job well, then I can avoid, you know, having only one group, you know, nod the head, right. Um, and the other group just sort of being there, you know, for the experience. Um, uh, I, and in terms of like training and things like that, uh, going to conferences um, like uh, Asala, uh, that is the best type of training I can get is being in the presence of, of brilliant black scholars uh, talking about their craft and having tough conversations about teaching and about topics and being in the room to witness that and then taking that back to my classroom. Um, I, I think that's the best pedagogical training that I've gotten is to, to surround myself with in a, a robust scholarly community, having the toughest conversations. Yeah. All right, Ever? that's what we have right oh. now. Um, so if you have more questions. Yes, I do. I wanted to know, because I'm not sure how much time we have left, but I wanted I wanted to know, again, the, the book offers such fascinating and rich stories um, about um, Chicago. Uh, what other fascinating stories uh, did you leave out? Um, in other words, what didn't make it into the book? Well, there's one, one person's story that I, I was not able to get because um, I hesitated. So there was a moment where um, through the help of Dr. Lionel Kimball, Kimball uh, at um, Chicago State, he put me into contact with um, an elderly man who was about 95 years old, who was a policy writer. And I was going to get to sit down with him and, and interview him, and do an oral history. But Sadly, before I was able to get there, he passed away. And so I wasn't able to get his story down. And and I think about that a lot because um there these stories they're out there, right? And so I'm I'm hoping that someone and maybe someday um we can we can get those oral histories about this moment down and on, on paper before they're all gone. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and that sounds that sounds like an NEH project for you. Yeah, that that would be great. <laughs> that would be great. Um, that's something to think about, really. Yes. <laughs> yes. Um, because there and, and so I I was able to do um a couple of oral histories for the project and um and every time I've presented um on the project, someone says, "Oh yeah, my my grandmother ran a policy shop, or my uncle he was a numbers runner, or and and so um." The, the stories are out there. There's yeah. so much more we could add. Um, yeah. Or, 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 you know, I would go down and give, uh, play my grandmother's numbers, like those yeah. types of story, like little kids, like, like I did in the, in the, in the nineties, uh, eighties in, yeah. in New York. Um, my last, well, two last questions, if we have time and you can pick, pick which one you want to answer. Uh, what, what do you hope readers take away from the book and what's next? what are you working on now i my hope that the takeaway is that um black women in this particular um area and when we talk about work in this particular field um the informal economy and then you focus into the lottery um their stories are powerful and the women are um there, there. I mean, the, that's uh, that's my hope is that just to take away just the multifaceted way in which they used policy to make a better life for themselves and their families, despite um, incredible adversity uh, and a very powerful Chicago police force uh, that the industry prevailed um, and that it was a very attractive option for Black women. Um, and they worked in it and they loved it. Some of them just loved it, the way they talk about it, uh, just joy, like, um, and the competitive nature and 
Um, and so just that there, these stories are really powerful. And I think it, it offers us new ways to think about work. Um, uh, yeah. And then in terms of what's next, I've been um, working, I've been looking at the lottery in New Orleans, because one of the other myths that I came upon in this book was that um, Chicago inherited policy gambling from New Orleans. Wow. And that someone brought it up from New Orleans in the um, late late 19th century. And I thought, oh, that's interesting. And so um, then I, I went down to New Orleans with a group of students and we were all doing research down there. Um, and I started to figure out some connections between um, the illegal lottery in New Orleans and some pretty famous civil rights icons down wow. there. And so I'm, I'm just sort of figuring out what that means yeah. um, and doing a lot of reading of secondary literature, um, figuring out New Orleans because it's such an interesting place. Yeah. Uh, it's race, racial history is just so unique. Um, so I'm excited to see how policy or policy, look at me, how um, the lottery <laughs> fits in that landscape. Yeah, and we're 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 excited about that work, and it needs to be a book on um, uh, southern uh, informal economies. I yes, don't know if there is one, right? So this yeah. that would be a definitely a, a major contribution as well. Mm -hmm. um, it's about six oh one. I'm not sure how much time we have left. I'm not sure if that's... yeah. It looks like we're about out of time. But thank you okay. so much. This has been such a fascinating conversation. I really enjoyed it. Um, do you have any final thoughts for us before we sign off? Well, I just want to say uh, congratulations, uh, Betsy. This is Thank a you. great. This is a great book. I wish you lots and lots of book talks, <laughs> and just enjoy this moment because it's a really great book. Thank oh, you. thank you, Lashawn. Thanks and for thank your help. you. Of course, yeah. and thank you uh, to the University of Illinois Press for hosting such a wonderful event. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Heather. Thank you, Illinois Press. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks, everyone. Have a wonderful night. Good night. Good night.